So uh, next we have uh, Stu Gilder uh, from LMU Munich, and he's going to talk about uh, integrated magnetic approach to solving the greater India problem. Thank you. Thank you. Well, when I was asked to give a talk in, in geography, paleogeography, I, I had no idea what I was going to do. So I just kind of gave that title. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring you through kind of a personal history of, of the problem of greater India from my point of view, mostly. And I'm trying to put in tidbits on as a paleomagnetist, things that I see are potential problems and how people use like uh, certain things, even the full test, maybe uh, in a new way to, to think about it. So that's kind of what I wanted to do. And so this is Tibet in white. I think everything above uh, 5,000 meters or 4,000 meters is, is in white. And I mean, what I love about our discipline is I'm really interested to know how topography is built in time and space. I call it the Delta Z problem. And I think it's one of the most unknown problems in earth sciences. How fast does topography get built in time and space? Okay, and I think Tibet is an amazing uh, example of that. And um, so what greater India is, is it's a part of the Indian uh, plate here that's been subducted, that's gone, right? And so this is a big debate, like how big was greater India? How big was the Indian plate before subduction? And uh, greater India, one of the first a uh, hypothesis was by this paper by Weavers et al. And it was material that was subducted. I think the idea was that it was continental crust that was subducted. And so you've just doubled the thickness of the crust. Okay, so that was kind of the original thing. And what I'd like you to do is I'm just going to show a quick movie about what's really influenced me. So you have kind of uh, Gondwana land and Laurasia and this Tethy Sea. And so this is a, a, a old um, movie by Jean Bess. And here what you see is he's put in a greater India. This is what he's decided. And, and I think this has kind of all the, um, this is in millions of years. And so what you're gonna see is India is on the Southern hemisphere uh, here. And so in the Cretaceous, then it splits away and then it's going to go all the way to the northern hemisphere, going, 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 going. And then you're also going to see here extrusion of landmass away and all the deformation uh, of, of Asia as it, it collides in. And so that's kind of going to take us on a tour of that movie. Um, so Greater India, this is one page. Uh, from this paper. And so essentially there are tons and tons of ideas about how big greater India was from essentially nothing uh, to quite big. And, and so um, the nice thing about this is I think paleomagnetism provides a useful tool to quantify this problem, but we have problems too. And so that's what I've decided to kind of incorporate uh, that. And so the two models on how Tibet gets formed, they're kind of two M members. You can do it mechanically, like I say, double the thickness of the crust. I make faults, things like that. Or I can do it thermally. And this is kind of uh, French versus English uh, uh, approach. One, I can put a big thermal anomaly there and I can make it buoyant, you know, or I can do it mechanically. And um, so one of the things is that they both can be tested with paleomag, right? If we don't see any deformation and lots of large scale, uh, deformation that's created offset, um, that would favor the thermal, or, uh, we can also test the mechanical part. And so one prediction of the mechanical theory is that when India hit then you extruded uh, Sundaland. And this was originally proposed by Teponye Molnar. And so what you see here is Sundaland, and here's South China. Uh, this is Hainan Island. I'll, I'll, I'll show you data from there. 
in a minute. And so here's the Red River Fault. And so one of the largest debates was how much motion has been on the Red River Fault. And that was the start of my PhD, which was in this box, uh, which is in Guangxi province. And so I'm gonna take you on a few uh, studies here. So this was the very first study uh, we did in Paleomag in, in Guangxi. So the Red River Fault is here. And there are these strike slip faults that have Cenozoic basins elongated along the faults. And there are also these pull apart basins here that also have Cenozoic uh, sediments. And then there are these Cretaceous basins. And so um, the first time we studied those, we saw a large counterclockwise rotation in the Yojang Basin here, and in these pull-apart basins, we found no rotation. In the Cretaceous Basins, we also found a, a counterclockwise rotation, whereas up to the north, we found no rotation. And so what we proposed with this is a little model. So if I take A fixed, so here's A, and B, this block here, if I, if I extrude it to the, to the south here, what I can see is I can rotate uh, this block 20 degrees and I can open these pull apart basins that would fill with sediment and get no, uh, uh, no rotation in there. And so we could actually measure the amount of offset on this fault to 24 kilometers. All right, well, that's not a lot of extrusion, uh, 24 kilometers, but we knew that these were Cenozoic to age sediments. And um, so we could say that at least that fault was active in the Cenozoic and was consistent with this left lateral motion uh, there, but the magnitude was much less. So then what we did, I'm just gonna show two slides in geochemistry. We mapped out the crust uh, isotopically and using uh, neodymium isotopes and rubidium uh, samarium uh, neodymium samarium and rubidium strontium isotopes. And the main thing that, that, that came out was that these granites, they, they kind of, if I plotted neodymium versus samarium, there were some really, really enriched granites in rare earths. And one of those I studied for my masters, it was a uranium deposit. And so when I plotted those on this map, they lined up on this line here, which are shown in these in these stars. And it's very strange uh, isotopes. I won't go into it, but it has very high mantle rich neodymium and very uh, radiogenic strontium. So it's a very strange thing. And there are lots of mines all along this line. And so the first thing that we saw is we call it the Shur Hong zone, Shur Wan Dashan Hong Zhou. Uh, basin is that almost all the granites, 90% of the Mesozoic granites and, and a lot of the basins were all to the south uh, east of that zone. And so when we did the paleomag along that zone, what we could see is that any of the paleomagnetic poles that were in the interior, so Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, they all lied very, very far away from the interior ones, including these from the Shurhong zone were all rotated also in a left lateral way. So there was deformation in this place, and it seems like the Shurhong zone was a, a boundary here. And so we know that there's slip, and we know that the trend of the faults here are, are northeast. And so when you see where that is, it's cut by the Red River Fault here, so, so this trend is cut, and we didn't see any other feature how we could extend uh, the Shurhong zone, except if we moved Sundalam more than a thousand kilometers away, all right? And so that's why I believe in extrusion. I haven't seen any other study that would make me doubt uh, that interpretation today, okay? And so, um, I think that that's a pretty good marker. And so what we would conclude was that extrusion was an important component of that. Okay, so now I want to go uh, on. Now 
what you can see since then. This is a compilation now. This is just uh, the rotations in the Cretaceous. And that was in the early 1990s. And now we have 2022. And now there's so much data in, in China that you can make a contour plot of the rotations. You know, so instead of showing like rotational arrows and plotting a bunch of arrows, you can contour it up and you can see that the that the rotations, the gradient in the rotations really follow the Red River Fault and maybe also show us where the Paleo Red River Fault is. So just to get that in your idea today, we're standing on the Pacific Plate uh, right here but maybe 20 million years ago it was actually part of the North American plate. And that's called plate capture, okay? And so maybe uh, that's also telling us something in there. And then there was a discussion in the pole uh, thing on what are rotated poles and non-rotated poles. And somebody wanted to try to tell me what is stable, uh, what is a stable pole. And in fact, most people would have considered that Sichuan province was stable, but for the Cretaceous, you know, it would be something more like uh, Hunan province would be more stable. So what's stable to one is not stable to another. So I would plead with the pole community that we accept all poles, whether they're from stable places or not. But now there's so much data there and Meng, uh, Jun Meng is responsible for the paleomagnetic database. And so we should make sure to, to hook up uh, with, with him on that. Um, so now I just want to show you one study uh, that that was the initiation of this from Hainan Island. And so when we first got the data, so these are our site means from Hainan Island that, that Jun collected. And what's interesting is at first view, if you do a fold test on those, you can see that the fold test is, is compatible uh, with a positive fold test. It's, it's K max at 100% unfolding, or it, does, it includes the case at 100% unfolding. And you'd say, okay, great. Wow, I have, you know, uh, Vandervoo of six, you know, I'm going to go home. But then if you were to do an inclinations only fold test on, on that, What's interesting is that it's negative, okay? And it's really important that people understand this. Like a fold test, you have to have a positive inclination only fold test. So no matter how I unfold anything, the inclination value won't change, right? If I have a plunging fold axis or something like that, I can change the, the declination, but I can't change the inclination. So what's the right result? So then, again, what's so amazing with China right now, there's just so much data. So these are just all the Cretaceous, it happens to be Cretaceous long normal sites, 104 sites, many, many different labs, many different users. And in fact, probably the right result is a synfolding magnetization. It's a beautiful result of a, of a synfolding magnetization at 60%. And if you do the same thing on inclination only, it's a maximum at 60% unfolding. Okay, so that's one kind of take home message is please double check your fold test with the inclination only fold test when you do that. And another thing that's really interesting is there are dikes that cut the red beds. And um, so there were actually, so there are three different basins that we sampled here uh, that had these dikes and it turns out that they completely fail the fold test. And what's interesting is that there's kind of two groups of, of directions. So what we claimed is that there were two pulses of, of intrusion of these dikes, okay? And we, could, we dated these dikes with uranium lead to 104.6. And we also dated tough intercalated with the red beds at 106.6. I guess I lost juice on that thing at, at 106.6. And so what this means is that you have a synfolding result. And then uh, when the folding is complete, you intrude the dikes. And so what we know is that the synfolding magnetization, this chemical remnant overprint, 
um, had to have occurred within a two million year window. So I think that this is important because there's a lot of overprints uh, out there, and there's a lot of overprints also when we get to the Himalayas. And so the question is, is well, when did the overprint happen? And is it really that bad if it's an overprint? Because if that's within two million years of my pole, as a tectonicist, that's really kind of nothing, right? It's not really going to change any interpretation uh, for that. But so um, that's another take home message that I thought was interesting from this study is how long does it take to convert a DRM to a CRM? And in this case, it was less than 2 million years. And again, um, this is now we're going to go further back in time for South China. I just wanted to add, you know, to put this in there because I know there's this poll discussion and you know, I know that the Australian compilation never uses my polls because they always say, oh, you're not in a stable craton. And so here are all the Permo-Triassic uh, declinations from South China. And, you know, so which is the true one? You know, so so everybody's always trying to tell me, oh, you know, uh, you know, somewhere up here is the true one. You can see that there's like a really nice kind of oroclinal bending here. And so we did do a study on that to try to say which is the best one. And so these are the paleomagnetic poles and each pole, right? If you say that one pole, like, like the West pole would put South China in a configuration like this, and what that would do is that would predict a paleo latitude uh, for each site on, on South China. And so what you can do is you can kind of do like a bootstrapping, which you know I'm not capable to do, but what you could do is you could just pick every single one of those poles, or if you're smarter now, we'll do the site method like Dawa and Matt were talking about. This was the study means, but it would be a lot better to do it in the site means. And then you can actually test which pole, if you take the difference between the expected paleo latitude and the observed paleo latitude, that would be the best fitting solution. So at that time, you know, I'm not a very good statistician, but you know, the true result should be some kind of Gaussian about zero. The difference should be zero. And you should have some kind of a statistic that has kind of a, a maximum peak about that value. So it would be way better to do similar studies. And also when people make these synthetic APWPs, you should always then check it against the plate. When you transfer to a plate, you should always check it. Because if you do that for India, you'll see that, that really very few of the Indian data actually lie on the Indian apparent polar wander path, actually match up with that. Okay, so um this is just one thing that people can do uh with polls and so okay so we're gonna leave south china which was a great place to work because it has the karst topography that was the type section of the devonian with the brachiopod up there and everybody was nice so now i leave santa cruz and i get to to paris the ipg uh and at that time the view of central asia at that time was that there was all kinds of, of required shortening, right? So if you took the inclination data and you reconstructed what Central Asia to do, there was like the black hole uh, had to kind of close up over a thousand kilometers uh, had to be closed by them. But that was only because there were very few data and they were all from Cretaceous rocks. There was very few Cenozoic rocks and so one of the studies that we did is we actually sampled a big pile. This is from Toyun, which is way out kind of near Tarim, near, near West Tarim. And we could sample volcanic rocks and compare them directly with uh, uh, sedimentary rocks. And then when we did it through time, you could see the blue is the Eurasian apparent polar wander path. This is the expected paleo latitude. All the, the black circles come from volcanic rocks. They match fairly well with the Eurasian apparent polar wander path. 
and all the sediments didn't. So if you were just in the Cretaceous and I wanted to tell you that there's a thousand kilometers of shortening in a hundred million years, you'd say, okay, you know, we can do that. But once you get to 20 million years, and I'm telling you that now you have to shorten it by a thousand kilometers and you say, wait a second, that, that, that there's no way with that. So there was a big debate uh, amongst us you know, what was the right result. But in the end, they're all continental red beds and there is a problem with, with shortening. And so now I wanna to go to Sube and Sube was really important because this was one of the first magnetostratigraphy sections uh, that people did in Central Asia. And that comes right along the Altantag Fault. And we collected 550 samples there and we matched with the the magnetostratigraphy between 26 and 19 uh, million years and we said oh there needs to be you know 1400 kilometers of shortening since 19 ma and there was no way to accept that but what i want to show you is there was a fault in the middle and i'm sure i'm pretty satisfied there's a fault if i break our section our two kilometer section into four quarters and I take the means of the four quarters, what you can see is the top of the section is rotated with respect to the bottom of the section. There's like a 15 degree bedding parallel uh, fault there. And you can also see it with the AMS K1 uh, directions. If I break up the section, I can also see that. So it was really satisfying because you know with the best fitting, it can be a little bit subjective but there's no subjectivity with the AMS, you get a result, right? And so we knew that there was a, a, you know, a 15 degree um, bedding parallel rotation. Well, here comes Tokes and Kent. And so Lisa asked me for that data set. And now I wanna talk about the EI method because I thought I reviewed that paper and I just said, please publish it as fast as you can. I think this is really gonna change our lives. And I think it has, and I think it's really an amazing tool. And so she used that data set and I just wanna kind of show you why people, some people aren't really uh, respecting the EI method so much. And so these were the original data. And if you didn't know about the fault, this fault, because we know that the bedding parallel fault is going to spread out declination with respect to inclination. So it's going to make more elongation. And let's see what it does. So if I just take the original data set and I do the EI, I get a correction going from 43 to 66. It's a lot, right? And then it gets, so now we don't need very much shortening in Central Asia anymore. And if you correct for the fault, um, you only get like a one degree difference. So in this case, with 222 samples, the, the effect of the fault is not that great, okay? But again, what we're talking about with Lisa is you could see, I didn't recenter these, but you could see in her paper, she recentered these. And you could see that they really are elongated east-west. But let's say you didn't pay attention to that. If I take that same data set and I rotate it about a center of mass, 45 degrees, right? The EI method still works, right? You're still gonna get a result, but this time it's only gonna tell you that the, the true in inclination should be 53, not 65. That's a big difference, okay? So one of the take home messages is you, you really have to, you know, take care of what we call the, the V2 direction. You have to make sure, and this is a correction that I'm hoping uh, Lisa will implement into the EI method is that it will check that the V2, you know, kind of the long axis of the ellipsoid, or which is really the intermediate axis of the ellipsoid, is directed in the, in the correct way or it should just tell you that that you you know you shouldn't do the ei correction a couple more things that i'd like to talk about so 
In this case, I took a new data set that we have, and this is done also on magnetostratigraphy, and I just randomly took 40 samples. So I ran the EI, and this is the EI corrected database. And then I randomly took 40 samples for that, and then I reran the EI. So there's not that much correction. It goes from 43 uh, to 45, two degrees. But now let's say you are using these as site means, okay? So you're going along, you're no longer in a magnetostratigraphic profile. You're trying to do something like the Irving and Kent APWP, and you're trying to correct the whole database uh, for EI. But that's not right, because here I just put in that same corrected database, and I just said, well, maybe there's little block rotations plus or minus 10 degrees. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to correct data that shouldn't be corrected, right? Because of there's just these little vertical axis block rotations. So now I go from 45 to 58, okay? So the take-home message there is you can't use the EI on site-level data. You know, you need to do it on magnetostratigraphic profiles, okay? Now, here's another thing. Now we're getting closer to home. Here's one that, you know, here are data from, from you know, greater India, from the, the, the Tethys uh, Himalaya that are often used to, to show a small greater India. And you plot these and you can see it's a, it's a small greater India because the inclination is so steep. And if you recenter these, you could say, oh, they're really elongate, right? And, and we should do the EI correction, except that these are from basalts, okay? And so now what Lisa's working on is, is something that we're calling uh, secular variation EI. And you can see that the blue is the distribution, is the ellipsoid of the distribution of the data. And the red is the distribution that you'd expect from, from a model from TKO3. And you can see that these are 90 degrees off. They're, 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 they're very, the distribution of the directions that you would expect is not correct. You know, so those data do not follow a, a, a any kind of field model. Okay, so they should not be used in a pole compilation. They pass a fold test right? You'd probably give them a six on, on, a, on a whatever Vanderbilt scale. Um, but I would argue strongly that there's something wrong with that data set. So I won't include it in, in my uh, reconstruction. Okay, so now we're ready to get finally uh, to greater India. And again, the reason why I've gone through all this is because it depends on paleo latitude which we have a lot of problems for. And it's a double problem because we need to know, I don't know if this is gonna work. Oh yeah. So we need to know what the Southern limit of Eurasia was, and we need to know the path of India. And so when these things come together, that's how we date the collision age, right? So I, one thing is anybody who wants to tell me that they know the collision age to better than 5 million years, you know, I mean, there's no way we have that kind of precision that we can do. But um, so this is the problem that we have is that, you know, we're, we know the trajectory of, of India and we know about where greater India is. And so how can we get to the extension? How can we know uh, how far greater India was? And so that's what I wanted to talk about. And so what uh, Jun Meng uh, did is he collected rocks in this blue path. And so this blue path is called the Tethian uh, Himalayan sequence. So most geologists tell me, tell the world that, that this probably belonged to India. It has affinities of the Indian Craton. Um, so that's kind of accepted. And so I'm going to take you through kind of uh, two studies that we've done. The first study where these two places, Zhongba and Tsona, 
that are about 130 million years old. And so this is the first one that I'll show. And then finally, I'll, I'll show you Jada. And so the first thing is these pass fold tests very robustly. You can correct them for EI, et cetera, et cetera. So they have all the characteristics with normal and reverse polarities. You know, what's interesting that, that you might not be used to is they're up and north and down and south. And that's because India was in the Southern hemisphere 130 million years ago. But one thing that we saw quickly was, well, wait a second, they're at about the same paleo latitude uh, today, these two points, but their paleo latitudes are nine degrees off. And, and how can we, we reconcile that? And so the way that we reconcile is with this great circle method. And so what we do is we plot the two sites uh, here, these are the two sites today. And what we know is that when India and Asia collided, let's say, if you're going to be super generous and say like 60 million years ago, we know that the convergence between India and Asia was north south. Okay. So if I plot a great circle that goes through the sites, what I know is that, you know, the original place has to lie somewhere on that great circle, right? So essentially you're, you're riding along, you get abducted and the plate keeps getting subducted, right? Underneath you. And so the question is, is where did you come from originally? And so what you can do is you can reconstruct uh, India in a 130 million year time frame, and we're the paleo latitudes uh, intersect with that great circle, that tells you that was the original position of those places in a greater India framework, okay? And that's why, and, and what you can see in this framework, you can see that two is at nine degrees Southern paleo latitude, south of one. And then after you rotate and collide, that's why they're at the same latitude today, but at different paleo latitudes in the past. And so this is how we define Greater India. And we suggested that Greater India was actually uh, quite large and different depending on where you were along strike of the Himalayas. And so this would be kind of how big Greater India was if it was on the surface today. It's subducted somewhere below. But now we're able to say uh, how big it is. And so now we can make predictions. We have a predictive model now. And so we could do it again, you know, and we now went to Jada. So the, the difference is Jada was 70 million years. So we could use our same definition of greater India. And now we could reconstruct the same greater India in a 70 a million year time frame, and where the great circle method crosses the paleo latitude is also at the leading margin of what we had defined as greater India. And there was another study from Gamba, which is 11, uh, that's, uh, you know, that's not our study, and that we were also able to show agreed well. And so when you look at these trajectories, you see that the trajectories, you can't have like one trajectory uh, on this graph for all of greater India. And that's because of the rotation. These two should coalesce at about, uh, they should coincide at about 60 million years after uh, India starts rotating. And uh, so we think that we were able to successfully predicted. There are problems. So this Gamba paper, again, is highly debated. There are lots of, of debates in this greater India thing. And so one side keeps saying, no, we have a positive fold test. Um, the other camp says, well, wait a second, you know, your, your, your hysteresis parameters plot 
on the SP to SD mixing curve, which is very characteristic of remagnetized uh, sediments. But again, I want to say is that a remagnetization event can, can be very, very quick and very, very quick after deposition. So it's not to say that I'm going to have a pro or con about this data, but the data do match our model and uh, very well. And so maybe they are overprinted, but maybe they were overprinted soon after deposition. Um, and now we're going to do this uh, one more time. And I did this essentially for this Martin data because there was uh, another paper that was published uh, at the same time as ours that concluded for a small greater India. They, they concluded that there was a less than 900 kilometer. And, you know, we're kind of perplexed by that because if we take our definition of greater India and we we reconstructed it 64 million years, we show again that that Ladakh arc fits very well with the leading margin of what we think was greater India. So I think that's what we're, we're at. We have another uh, poll that we're working at for 107, uh, 17 million years. And I think so far that most of the data that we see are all compatible with this large extent of, of greater India. So that's kind of what I wanted to show uh, today. So I have a blast doing paleomagnetism. I can't believe anybody would do anything different, right? I get to go all over the world, you know, looking at nice mountains, uh, drilling rocks. And, you know, we have more tests that, that, and, and methodology to improve and assess data quality. We can see that this is really happening right now. It's really exciting. Everybody I can see is really active thinking about, yeah, let's get away from these study means. Let's go to site means. Maybe we'll go to sample, uh, sample statistics. I don't know. I would really uh, recommend that everybody double checks that an inclination only fold test is, is consistent with your full fold test. Cause I've seen this more than one time, right? Uh, that they're not. For the EI test, you have to verify that this V2 trend is, <laughs> is, is in the right direction. And I think what we'll, we'll hopefully do is we'll, we'll do that with Lisa, who's, who comes to Munich uh, these days, is we can implement that. And we can also implement the directional data to say whether you, you've averaged secular variation or not. So I think that, that the method and the idea of using just directions uh, to say, even though uh, Ken has worked a lot on, on methodology to correct for inclinations, for me, to be able to do it with the directional data themselves is, is super duper powerful uh, uh, with it. So only use EI on a single continuous sections. Uh, never ever do, uh, like I see compilations, I read that and I say, no way. Uh, for, for just site means, um, what I think is the great circle method really consistently places these Tethi and Himalayan strata far from the present day Indian continent. The solution with the large greater India, I think can satisfy the vast majority of data that, that I would believe, not the ones that don't satisfy field models. I showed you one. There are a few of those that are used in poll compilations. Um, and one of the important things is that it's a contiguous plate in the in the Tethys Ocean that would preclude that you that Asia's southern margin was built through a succession of accreted terrains, at least as big as Greater India is. So there are implications for for geodynamics more than we think that it is. And you know, for me, I see reconstructions that break it up. Uh, the Tethys into different plates. And I'm always like, how can you do that? You know, you can make any kind of cartoon that you want. You could say there's a spreading ridge here, subduction zone there, but there's no data. The fact is, is that all the data parallel the path of, of the Indian continent. And it's only if you could show that that wasn't the case, could, can then you propose that there were other plates 
in the way. So I'm done there. I just want to um, show you that there is a, a way forward. So Justin just published a method that was very much like, like Brendan uh, showed, and I'm excited about that. This, you have to define your own components. Um, Justin has really complicated 800 million year old rocks with three components of magnetization, and that's true data, and that's his corrected data. When, and he can also tell you how much of each component went in to his Zydervelt originally. So he's got a poster out there, but I think it's time, but he's published this this last week, I guess. So anyway, okay. So Central Asia is a great place. I mean, look at that box fold. There's a car right there. That's a car. And look at that box fold and you get really, I mean, this is right in kind of near, near Tibet. It's a really nice place. Thanks. First of all, uh, very impressive Chinese pronunciation. Uh, 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 I guess my question is also, uh, so you, you study a lot of science in China, and are there any research opportunities in India? Like, if you guys go from there, uh, can you use that to do uh, some, some statistical data to help uh, reverse this model? Yeah, I mean, I've never worked in India, I mean, I do know that that when, you know, because I'm from France and, and from the Paris, so I was really uh, influenced by the Bess and Cortio model. And I remember when they came out with their master path and I actually plotted the data uh, that came from India on, you know, and I, and I tried to match it out. It didn't match up well at all. I mean, that was one of the things that I always thought, except for maybe the Deccan traps. So one of the problems is there's not that much, uh, as far as I know, there are not that much uh, outcrops of, of younger rocks. You know, it's mostly these Archean um, terrains on there. So um, what's that? There, there's my scene. Uh, if you want that, but I, I've never worked there, so I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Hi, Stuart. Um, you and I and Tam published a paper back in 2010 where we had the collision after inclination corrections at 43. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just checked it. Out. Yeah. It's, uh -huh. So is this difference because now you're accounting for a, a larger, greater India? No, I mean, though that study, I think, was from the Lhasa terrain, yeah. right? And so that was saying, and what we were saying is because we had a, a really high inclination that would make a later collision age, right? That's not really what I wanted to talk about now. I mean, I know a lot of people that's also debated those data uh, in there. Maybe some of those were dikes. Um, as far as neither one of us were there in the field for that, but um, but that doesn't really go into like I don't get excited about what was the age of the collision because I think we have so much uncertainty on where Greater India was, so much uncertainty on where Southern Asia was, and so much uncertainty about what the shape of Greater India was. That to me, it's not a very satisfying problem. Like I don't, you know, I'd say it's around, if, if you ask me, it's around 55 million years, plus or minus seven, maybe. And, and I don't think we'll ever do better than that. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Well, we can discuss this for the rest of the night. Yeah. Uh -huh. but, uh, I was just... I'm a bit puzzled by the by the by the rates of the method that you're using, but um, I think it's important there that we have a look at what we start with. You mentioned that there are geodynamic implications yeah. of the uh, bridge with the other the continental bridge with the other two and a half thousand kilometers wide. Yeah. There are a bit more than what you indicated. Um, my the reason that I became interested in this is that we have a geological record of the continental part of India that's about and which is the Himalaya, and that contains about 800 kilometers worth of continental upper crust. So, in your model, 
roughly 1,700 or 1,800 kilometers of continent that disappeared from the planet without leaving a geological trace. And the size of that is about the size of the radio. And if that is correct, then there are strategic problems. And uh, the first one is this was this was the conjugate of the total right trace. So this trace is going to find out. And the first question is why the trace on the speed exists, if they cancel that. The second is if continents the size of the radio can disappear, we can stop disrupting continental collisions because there could have been a full continent ahead of that collision that we simply never saw. And we cannot make reconstruction of Pangea or Rodinia because all continents could have been there and that's simply gone. Well, I mean, I need this. Uh -huh. this for is here. Uh -huh. There's in no other argument. This has been argued. So, this is why, why I'm puzzled by uh, this conclusion, and I would like to dig a bit deeper into the way you can see that. I, I never told you what the nature of the Indian crust was. So you just said it was continental. I never said that. It could be oceanic. I don't, I, I can't, I don't know, right? I, that, that's not a part of my, my argument. I mean, we know that the Farallon plates subducted a long time and we have like the Marysville Ophiolite that abducted and came up. I mean, there was subduction for a long time. They went way, way down. So that I, I've been very, very careful to not say what the nature of the India, the greater Indian crust was. That's very good. careful. So the security settlements in northern India, for instance, in the Trias, that uh, this was all India and So if you That's do right. that, yes, so. Okay. But just because it was Indian derived doesn't mean that it didn't get deposited on on an oceanic crust, right? The sediments. Yeah, there are, but you know, all that. I mean, you could argue with me that, and I could say, well, equally yes or equally no, right? But but what I can say is that every data that I can plot follows the trajectory of the Indian plate. That I can say. Any other questions? Uh, well, it's an Arctic Gale outside. But um, yeah, so I guess I had well, one one question was as it relates to this applying EI to evaluate uh, secondary variation. And I guess the question there is why do it in directional space versus PGP space? I guess a specific question in that would be I presume the example you show. That if you were looking at that BG and transferred it in with UPs, you would see that it's a really violating circular symmetry, um, because that's effectively what's giving rise to the shape, um, it, which would just would pretend you allow you to do a sort of picture QQ test. But am I thinking about it wrong, like doing it directly to base test? Yeah, I guess. I I have a bias of uh, 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 poles, right? Because when you we make a paleomagnetic pole, I mean, this is, you know, we're assuming like a dipolar field, like we we we, 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 the, yeah. we could, yeah. But but I still think that the 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 directional data is the one that we measure. Not we don't measure poles, we measure direction. So so I'm really biased about that. I like I like the original data. And then I, I was just one other question. I didn't completely get the line of arguments for not doing uh, EI analysis on multiple sections together. Maybe I was misunderstanding your definition of the site there. Mm -hmm. On your conclusion side, you said we should only do EI on individual sections. Um, given that we need by simple numbers, I guess if I'm working in a basin where I have presumption that it's being sort of say beige or sort of chunk of beige, why I wouldn't want to stitch directional data together for multiple sections. As long as I don't think there's economic complexity to support that, this sort of parasitic approach that you did. Is that what you? Yeah, the, the, I think that there's always a little bit of tectonic complexity. And I didn't show you a case. I, I wanted, if I would have had more, more time last week, I wanted to show you a case that you can convince yourself is that let's say you had a cylindrical fold, a very tight cylindrical fold, and you. You just let's just say in the perfect world it was a perfectly cylindrical fold, 
But then you took strikes and dips and your strikes and dips have uncertainties on them. And now if you take, if your strikes are, are off like 10 degrees this strike there and 10 degrees this strike there, again, what you're gonna do is you're gonna broaden out declination with respect to inclination, okay? And so even the, the, the structural correction, if you have multiple strikes and dips, you know, you have to be really careful about that. If you can show you have a perfectly cylindrical fold, and if you plot all of your fold axes up and you show I have a perfectly cylindrical fold, then maybe I'm willing to accept that, right? I couldn't say no, but usually you don't have that. Usually when I'm reviewing the papers on the EI, Sometimes you can get strikes and dips that are 90 degrees different, like two sites that have strikes 90 degrees different. And people are doing the EI on, on, on those. And that's not right. Yeah, yeah. No, okay, fair point. So you say you stuff up that you could be, could be in trouble. Yeah. I guess one thing is that you consider the uncertainty uh, on the F factor that comes out of the EI, you're, you're going to be in the sort of less problematic spot of. Uh, just given that the bootstrap uncertainty ranges are often pretty pretty large, uh, often little caps that. Yeah, but but you know people are really focused on the means, right? And again, you know what I wanted to show is also like with this V two direction, you could have the exact same thing, and you rotate, and you'll get a different result. Yeah. So there needs to be two iterations with the EI. One, you know, is my elongation direction acceptable okay and then to if yes then ei yeah totally.